Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our community. I am in such a good mood right now. I had such a good day, which is crazy because I'm on my period. So being in a good mood is wild. I do find I'm worse right before my period in terms of mood than on my period. So I guess it's not that crazy. But I'm starting to become a period influencer. And I know people hate when people talk about their periods too much. So I'm going to shut up. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. Let's get into what's in alignment and out of alignment for us this week. As always, you guys, please share it with me via voice note on Geneva. However, whatever tickles your fancy, but I'm in a great mood. I love having a free weekend to myself. We'll dive into it. This is what's in alignment for me. I'm feeling very relaxed and free. I just went on, as you know, I didn't post last week on the podcast. I was in Colorado visiting family and we were visiting Ethan's sister. She just had a new bebe and we went with Ethan's parents and it was just so, oh, something about being in the mountains is glorious. So freeing. I don't really, when I'm on a trip or with friends, I'm really good about unintentionally kind of being like really present and not thinking about social media. And it was just so nice. And another reason I'm in such a good mood is I'm vlogging again on YouTube. I took like two months off and I was convinced that it just, you know, that wasn't it. That was a failed, like not in a negative way, just like, oh, that wasn't the thing. I'm kind of over it. Don't want a camera in my face every day. What really happened was I started putting so much pressure on it that I was paying an editor that like every single week that was like a fancy editor and was spending way too much money, started feeling the opposite of abundant. Like I was living in lack because of how much I was spending versus how much I'm making in my full-time job. Like I couldn't fund living in New York City, paying a YouTube editor once to twice a week, paying podcast studio, paying a podcast editor. Like it was just getting too much. And then I felt like, why am I on YouTube if I can't, you know, do it to the fullest and make all these like extravagant videos, but we're back. I posted a vlog. I was like, I don't know. I'm feeling it. And I got all of these comments and everyone was like, I'm so happy you're back. People had been DMing me, asking me where my vlogs were. And we can just like tell ourselves a totally different story than what's happening. I, I don't know what happened to me on YouTube, but people like, I mean, if you're listening, so many of you just reassured me, like, we don't care. We just want to see you show up. If you miss a week, we literally don't care. Like, we just want to see your vlogs. Like, just love your vlogs. So stop putting so much pressure on it. So that's where we are. We're stopping putting pressure on it. It's been feeling really good. I'm really excited about vlogging again. And I just feel like myself when I'm thriving in YouTube, like I'm always in a great mood when things are good on YouTube. So it's something to just remember. And I really don't have any plans on the calendar on the, for weekends until September. So I'm loving that I have a lot of free time on the weekends coming up. But anyway, I'm feeling great. Not putting so much pressure on anything at all. Just, just live in life. <laughs> and I feel like I'm like this every summer. I'm very like, there's just so much more to focus on than social media and career. And I also just feel like as I'm getting older a little bit, we're turning 27, we're getting engaged. Like I'm putting myself together more like physically. I'm trying to mature a little bit. We value stability and money more than ever. And we're just being a little more responsible. We're looking a little more mature a little bit. Not really, but I don't know. I think I'm just in a really good mood. I had an event this morning, like a yoga influencer event, which I'm never able to attend. They're always during the work day. So I had that, had some podcasts to record. It's just a good day. So let's get into what's out of alignment. Worst period ever. I have not had a period this bad in so long because I've been so on top of my hormone health. And honestly, this just showed me how it really pays off when you focus on your wellness and your hormone health because I fell off this month. I haven't been seed cycling. I was in high altitude in Colorado. I haven't even been paying attention to where I am in my cycle and like kind of adjusting accordingly with like the intensity of my workouts or anything like that because I wasn't doing anything so intense. So I just didn't think to, but it's funny when you stop paying attention and I didn't have maca powder for a while in my coffee because I was in Colorado and all these things, like I wasn't doing really anything to help myself. 
had the worst period ever. So in some ways, it taught me a really great lesson that the things I am doing normally are working. So that's what we're focusing on is just getting back on track with all that, with hormone health, with, you know, I don't have any trips coming up in August. So it's going to be a lot of just getting back on track hunkering down, getting a little more serious with the half marathon training, I, all the things, just like getting back on track with YouTube, with running, with my period, and just getting it together. So let's breathe in what was out of alignment for us this week and breathe. No, no, don't do that. Breathe in what was in alignment for us this week. Breathe out was what was out of alignment for us this week. <sighs> okay. Quick product recommendation of the week. As I said, I've been trying to put myself together a little bit more. And part of that, I've been a little into jewelry these days. I think ever since ring shopping, I got the jewelry bug. And I'm trying to just get better. I think just knowing that eventually I'm going to be wearing a diamond ring every day. I'm like, I, I got to get some other jewelry just to like feel a little bit more put together in that sense. So obviously a diamond is white, silver, whatever the hell you want to call it. So I've been going with mostly gold jewelry. I love a mixed metal look. So I've been getting a bunch of rings on Bobble Bar. They have sales all the time. And my earrings are mixed metal from Shashi. And I'm just like loving wasting my money on jewelry right now. (laughs) Okay, let's get into this episode. It is all about trauma. Don't worry. It's not super dark. It's actually really helpful, really insightful. And Allie is like a wonderful positive spirit and she's just really calming. So don't get triggered by the, by the title, anything trauma related. So her name is Allie Cates. She's an emotional health coach. Her mission is to teach individuals how to gain authority over their life and over their emotions so they can heal from their past conditioning and learn how to find healing from their emotional pain, trauma, and limiting beliefs. Through her own healing journey, she became a certified trauma-informed coach, and she is a somatic experience practitioner, and she actually is giving you guys a promo code. So if you use code Jen Lauren, I will put the link below. You get 20% off her course. So she has an online course. Ooh, just dropped my water bottle. She has an online course where it's a self-paced somatic healing course. Um, I'll link it all down below, but she's giving you 20% off, which is pretty insane. The topics that we hit... We talk about trauma-induced IBS and how trauma can manifest in the body in physical ailments, how emotional affects the physical body, basically, and what happens when you don't want to talk through all your wounds and all your trauma and you don't really love talk therapy and you don't see the point in unleashing their dragon and like talking about things that are painful. She's going to talk about why it is important and also alternatives to talk therapy that are more about getting into your body than just talking about your traumas, talking through your traumas. We talk about nervous system regulation, what we can do every day for our nervous system and our emotional health and well-being. And yeah, enjoy the episode with Allie Cates. Allie Cates. I just said her weird, her name. Oh my God, guys, I'm losing it. Anyway, don't forget to subscribe over on YouTube. You can watch these episodes fully in video on our YouTube channel, Dare to Self Care, or you can go hang out with me on Jen Lauren, my YouTube channel, because I'm back, baby. I'm in a silly mood today. Okay, I'm going to go now. Enjoy the episode. My biggest question for you, I would say, is when I think of trauma, And people I know that have experienced trauma, I think there's like two types of people. And this is just me talking like out of my ass and not an expert. But I feel like there's people that are like, I want a trauma dump. I want to go to therapy. I want to talk about this all the time. And then there's people that are like more in the camp of we don't need to talk about everything. I don't really want to talk about that all the time. It's just going to like open a wound and it's painful and like I'm good. Like I don't really want to go there. Yeah. So I'm curious your kind of your response to what is the benefit of going there, of opening the wound, of unleashing kind of like the demons within. Cause you know, you can go into trauma therapy and leave feeling way worse because now you're in it and thinking about the thing that you don't want to think about. Yeah. I mean the benefit is really like nervous system regulation. It's like not having that feeling like for me, I know, and for a lot of my clients, it's like that feeling that 
eventually like shit's going to hit the fan, whether you deal with it or not. Right. So whether or not like, like when people say like, oh, I'm just kind of shoving it down or like leaving it alone and I don't want to dive into it. I'm always like, ooh, is there some like disassociation here, which is keeping you like healthy, like not healthy is keeping you safe, right? Mm -hmm. The disassociation is keeping you safe from actually feeling the thing. But my own personal experience is that when you disassociate from it, it's going to show up in whether that's autoimmune, IBS, stomach issues, disease, cancer, et cetera. Like it's somehow going to show up in your body. So you can either like deal with it proactively kind of ahead of time before you hit that point, or your body is going to be like, F you, I've been running in fight or flight for a long time. And here it is. Wait, this is so interesting because that's what I was kind of going to ask you as you were talking. I was like, okay, if it's keeping you safe, then like, what's the issue? Like, cause that's what I would hear someone like that say is like, well, it's keeping me safe. Great. Let me move on with my life. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Cause I'm sure so many people have the experience of, I mean, I've dealt with IBS for a very long time, finally healed. What is IBS even? It's kind of like a made up thing. It's really (laughs) just digestive issues, but that's a whole other subject. But it's funny. I think a lot of people can sort of have these physical symptoms and just not even realize it's due to the, you know, suppressed trauma. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then there might be someone who's like, how can you actually say that that's what it is. Like, this is some woo-woo stuff. Like, is there any yeah. science behind, Yes. like, no, this isn't just woo-woo bullshit. Like, you can yes. actually trace it back. Yes. So for anyone that's like, oh, this is woo-woo BS, like, I highly recommend reading the book, The Body Keeps the Score, yes. Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine, What Happened to You by Oprah and Dr. Bruce Perry. Like, there is science and research around what happens when your body holds on to trauma and how it manifests. And also more recently, they're doing studies that IBS is like a nervous system dysregulation. So instead of it being like a stomach problem, which when you go to the doctor, you go to five different gastroenterologists and all this stuff, like they're, yeah, right. (laughs) They're going to say like, oh, this is a stomach problem. We're not sure what it is. And now they're doing more of the research that actually it's a nervous system dysregulation, which is causing your stomach to be like having these like dysbiosis, SIBO, et cetera, kind of stuff happen to it. It makes complete sense. And then What's interesting, I actually would love to have my sister on. This is like more her story, but she's an open book. But I would love to hear her take on this because my sister actually ended up going to a trauma-based rehab center and they did, she did like deep-rooted for a couple of months or something, EDMR, like all of the things. And she ended up having fibromyalgia and all these physical symptoms due to kind of unleashing the trauma. So I mean, obviously you don't know her experience, but just in general, yeah. can sometimes trauma therapy almost be done the wrong way? Because it's interesting, like what actually led to her trauma-based physical symptoms was unleashing the trauma, if that makes sense. Completely. So that was my experience is that at 22, okay. like all of my trauma kind of came up. We lost seven people in two and a half years. And yeah, it was intense. And oh I like- went into intense trauma recovery. And then three and a half years in was when I was diagnosed with late stage Lyme and like multiple autoimmune conditions three weeks before we got married. So I was under high stress, planning a wedding, like helping run a business, all this stuff. And that was me as I was like, how come now that I'm in trauma recovery, I'm having all of these symptoms in my body show up, right? And it was because I was living so disassociated from my body. I was living so up here outside of my body. And I feel like a lot of people can relate to this. It's like I was feeling really glazed over, right? And that's like a good sign of disassociation. So for me, like after doing that intense trauma recovery for three and a half years, like really intensely was when I was like, holy crap, there's something wrong with my body. Like I'm in a lot of pain, but I kept on shoving it down and just ignoring it. So is it kind of like while you're in this trauma therapy, you're still doing the thing where you're trying to keep yourself safe from the trauma therapy? Okay. 100%. So it's still the same route. It's just you can be in trauma therapy and your body's almost working 10 times harder to disassociate, to keep yourself safe and therefore causing physical distress. Yeah. Because that's the thing that's kept you alive is disassociating from the pain. Like that's a healthy coping technique that we have. But when we stay in that place for too long is when the body goes 
into fight or flight. And then we have all these hormones and then that causes autoimmune disease, right? That's the stuff that happens. So how can we, let's say, and we'll take it, we'll take it back after this, but like, it, let's say we are in trauma therapy or ther- like talk therapy, whatever it is. How can we work to stay present and not disassociate? Even even if it's not in therapy, I think a lot of people, even through grief, it's just like disassociating in your day to day. And how can we work to stay present so that we don't have the physical ailments, but then also not walk around just like depressed sitting in our trauma all the time? Yeah. I always tell people is like the first thing is like to acknowledge where you're at. So like acknowledging your emotions of what's coming up. And then naming where you're feeling that emotion in your body. So like connecting that to your body. So most people, when they feel anxiety, they're like, I feel it in my chest and I feel it in my stomach. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and people are like, I don't want to feel that in my stomach. And especially if you've had gut issues, which like, I know a little bit of your background that you've had gut issues. I've had crazy gut issues. Like I was going to have a blog called the potty princess and like name all of the bathrooms. Wait, I love that. Yeah. I'm like, it was very bad. positive in this household. <laughs> so I love that. <laughs> I was like, it was so bad. So I completely understand that. But yeah. I was trying to run away from this feeling in my stomach. Like I couldn't tolerate this feeling in my stomach. Hmm. So I always tell people is like, try to just like sit with the emotion for like five seconds or one second or three seconds. And then the second thing is like, or the th- the last thing is you can do different techniques like scanning the room. So when you're feeling out of body or you're feeling overwhelmed, just literally slowly turning your head to the right and like looking at things that are in your space. And then slowly coming back through center and then slowly turning your head to the left and like, okay, here's my Yeti. Here's like the wall. Here's a plant. Like so that your body recognizes that there's no metaphorical tiger that's chasing you. Right. It's interesting because I can't imagine being in a spot where I feel almost forced to access pain. And it's it's hard because in the moment you're just like, why? Like, I don't like you don't see any benefit to accessing this pain, to feeling what actually happened to you, whether it's losing someone or sexual trauma, whatever it might be like in that moment, there is literally no positive thing that can come from that. But what you're saying is you're almost preventing, like you're, you're releasing and feeling it all now so that you don't have, you're not storing the trauma in your body for later. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause eventually it's going to show up. Like we can either disassociate from it for so long, or it's going to show up in some health way. Right. Right. And is there anything else you can do outside of talk therapy? Cause I know a hundred percent. Okay. Cause I know yeah. like I have specific people in my mind that have gone through some serious shit and they're just like talk therapy was not for me. This person's just like, Oh yeah. And that must be really hard. And they're yeah. just like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for, it was hard. I know. <laughs> yeah. For me, like when, so my husband and I, before we lost, like we're when we lost the seven people, we lost three of them in nine and a half months back to back. And that's when all of my repressed childhood trauma, sexual trauma came up really strongly. Wow. And so I had been to talk therapy and like counseling before my life and nothing really seemed to move the needle because I was just talking about the things and trauma lives in the body. doesn't live in the brain. Right. So I always tell people is like, if you want to heal your trauma, you can't out talk it because we're always constantly thinking in our head. So I'm like, well, you could heal yourself if you could just out talk your trauma in your head, right? So you have to take a body approach to it. So when I was 22 and I lost these three people in nine and a half months, I went on like a healing quest. I tried everything. I tried hypnotherapy, EMDR, psychotherapy, like um, neuroplasticity, like all these different things and nothing seemed to move the needle because I still felt like my body was like, like it felt like I was like itchy. Like I wanted to pull my skin off almost. Like I was like, I can't tolerate this. And that's when I found a trauma recovery coach in the, in the area that I'm living in. And he worked with veterans for 40 years. And he's like, you know, in everyday individuals get trauma. And he's like, this is what you're going through. And so he helped me work with the body and he was actually doing like manual body work as well. And that like completely changed my life because I finally felt like safe. And especially individuals that have gone through sexual trauma, you're constantly looking over your shoulder, you're keeping one AirPod out, like you're constantly surveilling your area. And I 
like do not do that anymore because I have found like safety in my body because my body's not in fight or flight. Wow, that's incredible. And I also think that's probably really freeing to anyone who has been looking for something to feel better but doesn't like talk therapy because one, you might need something else, but also like not everyone wants to just talk. Not everyone feels relief from that. I think a lot of people with, you know, there's this whole idea of like big T and little T trauma, which just side note, what are your thoughts on that? And first, I guess, can you explain the two for anyone who doesn't know? Yeah. So big T traumas are kind of like the things that we think about when we're thinking about trauma. So like rape, war, car accidents, right? Like losing someone, Little T traumas are more of like the little things that can happen in your life. So if someone says something to you or talks down to you, and I always explain it like this is that people with trauma is really about what, how it left your nervous system after the said event. So I explain it like this is let's say there's two people, there's person A and there's person B. Mm -hmm. Person A comes from like a regulated home. They move their emotions out of their body and person B comes from a home where like they have gone through trauma, they don't know how to move the emotions out of their body, and they both witness a car accident. Person A maybe thinks about it for a week, uses its tools, goes home, goes home, goes on their their merry way. Person B is like constantly thinking about it for the next three to six months, like wanting to call the hospital, wanting to check in on the person that's gone through the car accident, right? And this is how I describe hmm. like big T and little T traumas is that it's not always about the event, it's about how it left your nervous system. So if you have enough little T traumas, they can land in your nervous system the same way if you've had a big T trauma. Okay. First thing to say on this is you're selling me on, not that I needed to be sold, but working through your trauma. Cause I just, I know a lot of people who have been through a lot and just don't, you know, in their words, I just don't like therapy. I just don't like it. And you're, it's just becoming more clear to me that analogy you just made of the two different people, how working through it and finding different avenues. It doesn't have to be talk therapy, which we could get into. It will allow you to live your life better and healthier going forward. Mm -hmm. And then my second thing I wanted to say was this might be an unpopular opinion. I don't like the idea of big T and little T trauma. I think little T kind of diminishes someone's experience. I think that we can't be comparing one person's trauma to another. Like, oh, that person has a big T trauma and, and you know, I have a little T trauma because I think so often we kind of, even people with big T traumas, diminish our own trauma. Like, for example, someone who might be like, oh, I want to go to a trauma specialist, but maybe my trauma is not big enough. Like I shouldn't go because I haven't been raped or I didn't lose a parent. I lost a cousin or whatever it might be. Like we're comparing a little too much. So that's why I don't love the idea in general, big T, little T, because I think we can get caught up in like, oh, mine's classified as, like you said, it could be a bunch of of little T's that that enable you to then kind of need trauma therapy because – you are having that response, but because they're classified as little T's, someone might not get the help they need because it's like, oh, you know, I, I don't need a trauma recovery coach. I didn't lose a a parent or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I always say to people too, is that, I mean, let's just take the example of being raped, right? Mm -hmm. You talk to a girl that, you know, was drugged at a party and was raped. She's going to say she wasn't raped because she wasn't in a back alley. Like it's always a degree worse. Right. And so I think that people often will just dismiss their own things that are happening in themselves because they're like, it's not as bad as exactly what you're saying. Oh, it wasn't as bad as this. Right. I mean, I have a lot of women coming to me that have sexual abuse in their past and they're like, but it wasn't as, they're always trying to say that it wasn't as bad as the person that had it worse. Yeah. It's like, but it doesn't matter because it is hard on your body and you're still stuck in fight or flight. So like you have to work through it at some point. And I agree with you. Like everyone at this point, we've been through a collective trauma with COVID, right? So like everyone at this point has been through something. No one goes unscathed. And it, you know, it doesn't matter whether you've been through big T, little T, like if you are feeling out of body and you're feeling these symptoms, you have to look at them and go, what's going on? What's coming up for me? And then get the support that you need. Totally. Can you kind of draw back on, it could be your personal experience or like common experiences of clients, almost a before and after of like 
before you sought out the treatment that eventually was like helped you Mm -hmm. kind of maybe before how you would have reacted to something or before whatever, but whatever, like a before and after looks like, if that makes sense of response you might've had to something before versus now that you've worked through your trauma and worked with a specialist, how you would react now, like how it's kind of bettered your life. That's such a good example or such a good question. Um, I'm trying to think. I have so many examples running through my head oh, right good. now. I can pull from my own. I'll pull from my own personal experience. Great. So let's say for me, something that was really big was having these big reactions, um, like anger reactions. So I always, do, do you watch Yellowstone? I Yeah. Okay. So I always say like my reactions are like Beth Dutton. Like when I am in fight or flight (laughs) mode, I go into fight mode and can like drop you with my words. And it's not something that I'm like super proud of, but it's something that I can recognize. Like I would just hit where it hurt because I didn't know any other way to cope with what was coming up, these big emotions that were coming up in me when I got triggered. Right. And, you know, it took time to actually work through that and to resolve that repressed anger that was in there for years in my body and my mind and my soul. But now I can like go into a situation when something is triggering me and I want to come out in that fight mode, I can now stop it. Whereas before I couldn't stop it. It was like such a automatic response for me. And now I have more, you know, resolve and I have more resilience and like tolerance in my nervous system and my body to go, you know how this is going to go if you let like the fight mode come out. So like, for example, when, you know, someone comments something on like Instagram and I had this recently where I like put out something that was people didn't love. And, you know, there were people that were like coming out in this space. And I'm like, you know, I could go here in like a fight mode and really, you know, say unkind things to these people in the comments. But I'm like, I don't need to do that anymore because it's not this old pain that's driving my present, right? And that's what happens. So I hope that's a good example of like Absolutely. normally my response would be to fight verbally. Absolutely. I think it really just like to sum it up is how you handle your triggers, basically. Like the triggers are still going to be there, but it's mm-hmm. like managing them and being able to kind of like come back to yourself quicker yep. in a way and reckon and be a little more self-aware and just like regulate your emotions a little bit better is kind of what I heard from that. Yeah, exactly. And not, I mean, the trigger is still there, of course, but it's like my reaction to it is so different. Right. If I put out this, you know, content five years ago, I would have just been like either going off or I would have just left and just like deleted the video. Yeah, that's really cool. It's cool to recognize like how far you've come to through the work because sometimes the work is painful, but it's cool to see it actually pay off. And that's why I was like, I'm like asking for specifics because you never know someone might be thinking about getting help and hearing that there, it actually works and kind of being able to apply it to your own life is cool. So what's the difference between like a grief counselor and then what you do, which is like trauma recovery coaching? Is there a difference or do you use this is kind of a separate question, but do you use different techniques on each client or do you have a specific thing that you do? Yeah. So when you're talking about like therapy or counselors, like they typically do, you know, if you're talking about like an LMFT or CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, like they're doing a top down approach. So they're bringing the brain on first and then kind of going down. That's what we call it in like psychology, right? What I do is I come from like a bottom up approach. So I bring the body on first because when you're dealing with trauma, it is in the body. So it depends on the client and where the client is coming in. So if we're working online, we're doing more coaching, we're doing more somatic experiencing, which is what I focus primarily on is, you know, somatic experiencing, getting people into the body, learning different tools to help them really regulate their nervous system. If we're working in person, I mean, it looks different, but there could be hands-on body work, um, you know, somatic experiencing, coaching as well. But it really depends on the client and where their nervous system is. Some people will come in and can tolerate like 30 seconds of feeling their emotions. Some people can come in and tolerate only one second of feeling their emotions. So yeah, you have to work with where their nervous system and their body is. What is a somatic experience? Could you give like detailed examples? Because I actually don't know. Yeah. So somatic experiencing is really just somatic is body, right? So 
somatic experiencing was this gentleman named Peter Levine who wrote the book Waking the Tiger. Have you ever read the book Waking the Tiger? No, but I've heard. I know exactly what it is. I've been meaning to read it. Yeah. So I'm studying under his work right now. It's like a three-year practitioner training. And it's about helping clients helping clients regulate their nervous system by finding like places in their body that feel safe Mm -hmm. and then going to places in their body that don't feel safe. And then you're building, like, I know this is really heady, but like you're building this ability to, um, gain more, more tolerance in your nervous system. So somatic experiencing and people use the word somatic all the time, like breath work, yoga, like we use this in many different ways. So somatic just means body essentially. Okay. So you're using kind of a bunch of different tools and techniques. Yes. Okay. Got it. So is there anything that you do almost as like maintenance every day to help regulate your nervous system or anything that like we can all be doing that's easy every day for our emotional health, for our nervous system regulation? Yeah. I would say the scanning is really important. So when your body thinks it's in fight or flight, it's going to like look go like this it's only going to look at what's in front of you yeah so just like being able to scan maybe you're like out on a run or you're walking to get coffee and just like taking a second maybe you're at a stop sign and just looking around at you and like actually looking at things because it helps your body and your brain know that you're not like the metaphorical tiger is not chasing you so that's like my one tip that I'll give people because like some people don't love doing breath work. Some people don't love like tapping into their body, but at least if they can just scan the room and see like what's around them. Like if you scan the room, you'd look at your plant, you'd look at probably your computer, your microphone. I don't know what's over to the other side of you, but <laughs> <laughs> you'd look at these things in your room and just yeah. like look at them for just like, like a tiny second. It's a good practice in general, like in just being present because I think – we're all on our phones and technology all day long, whether we're on Zoom or scrolling TikTok or on a walk listening to a podcast. And like just taking a second to look around, you honestly might get like the most creative idea in the world just by taking a freaking second. <laughs> yeah. And it's so true. I mean, there's this gal at our apartment complex and she's like always on her phone. Like literally she'll walk her dog and she'll always just be on her phone all the time. And I'm like, she is in freeze mode because she's just looking at her phone and we all are in our narrow vision, right? Like if you're content creating, if you're editing anything, you're in narrow vision. So just creating your vision to go outward is so helpful. Yeah. I also like just up. (laughs) Like I feel like we're all just (laughs) looking down at all times and I hate to be like an old lady. Like I'm so guilty of it. But these practices, even like going on a walk and intentionally saying I'm not going to go on TikTok. Like I'm I'm going to look up or I'm going to listen to music instead of a podcast or nothing because I'm always consuming content. Just like getting a little more intentional with it. And also for me, it's been doing things that aren't career oriented or like Mm. side hustle oriented or hustle oriented because I'm, I'm very on the go. And to an extent, it makes me very happy being career oriented and driven, but like taking the time to just hang out with friends, to just go for a walk, to not have plans, to have quality time. Like that is something I've really been practicing. It's, it's, why I signed up for a half marathon just to like focus on something that's not so like, I don't know, like technology and career driven and oriented. I feel like that has to affect your nervous system too. Oh, completely. Cause you're, when you're just focused on your career, you're in fight or flight. You're like, yeah. this is the thing that I have to do. And these are all the tasks and your body's like, okay, go, 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 go. Like I used to always say is that I perform best under pressure, which like I still have to tap into that at times, Mm -hmm. but like, that's a sign that your, your nervous system's in fight or flight, right? Is if you're like, I do best when I'm super stressed out and I have to wake up super early and have three coffees a day. Like, and most of us are, are geared that way. Talk about IBS. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's when my IBS was the worst. I was not sleeping well. I was having a lot of coffee. I was so stressed with work. Like the stress really does manifest in the body. And I think so often we'll like go to a doctor and they're like, reduce your stress. And it's like, you're like, how? 
literally how do you want me to quit my job? Like, what am I supposed to do? I need money. I have a kid, like whatever it is. And so that's why I think these like tools of regulating your nervous system and getting actually specific with it is so helpful because so often it's like, yeah, stress is causing IBS, reduce your stress. And no one knows how that's why I'm like any daily practices you can give. And you just saying like, even after a zoom call to just look around the room or get outside for a second. Like we always make so many excuses, but yeah. something as easy and like quick as that. I feel like we can all take a second to do. Yeah. The scanning is huge. Just turning your head slowly left and right. And really looking at these things is like, literally, if you do that for 30 seconds a day, like let me know how it goes, okay. but it will really change things. Yeah. That's like meditative. Are there any other things that your clients will do outside of your sessions on the day to day that really seem to help? Having a morning routine is huge and not looking at your phone. Like I always tell my clients, do not look at your phone for at least, at least the first hour upon waking. I mean, I love to have like an hour and a half, but like some people like I can't because I need to check, you know? Yeah. 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 But it really is because if you're on your phone or on your computer, you're going into that narrow focus, which is then having your nervous system go, ah, something's going on. Like, huh? So it is, it is related to nervous system. I know that it's like really trendy right now that we all talk about like morning routines and not looking at your phone and it can be exhausting to hear all of this. But like, even if it's 30 minutes without your phone and just really taking in your environment can help your nervous system regulate itself before you go into a busy day. Yeah. Every time I'm with friends or traveling, I find that my phone is like nowhere to be found and it is the most freeing calming like I don't realize it because I'm just so present and then later you're like I haven't felt this good in a while yeah. and that's why <laughs> and it sucks because like on our normal day-to-day -day, we're so attached to these to these things but when you start even just like going to the bathroom and you're like okay I don't need my phone to yes. go to the bathroom like stupid little things like that do help Yes. Well, because you're using it like we're unconsciously using it as like a regulating tool. Yeah. Interesting. To be like, okay, we're looking in this like narrow vision. And like Peter Levine talks about this is like animals out in the wild. How come they don't get traumatized and specifically prey is because they complete what's called like a stress cycle. So hmm. they go from being triggered to fight or flight to discharging their emotional pain and then going into rest and digest. Most of us go triggered, fight or flight, tr triggered, fight or flight. And we build this emotional charge in our body and then that never gets released, right? So when you're going into this narrow vision, imagine you're, you're, you're telling your body you're in fight or flight, whether you're conscious of it or not. So that's why I'm like, even just putting the phone away when you don't go to the bathroom. And trust me, like I'm guilty of it too when I'm super busy. I'm like on my phone or like yeah. texting late at night or like looking at emails and responding late at night. Like I'm so guilty of that too. And I have to remember is like, Ali, put the phone away. Like this is not helping you in the long haul, right? Yeah. It's very easy. I think what I'm realizing, it's easy when I'm with other people, friends, family, whoever to just neglect the phone. It's a lot harder when you're alone or live alone. Like I could not put my phone down when I lived alone. Do you yeah. have any tips for just like when you're completely alone, how are you supposed to, because connection is also really important. So it's mm -hmm. like people could, you, you know, say I'm using my phone to connect with others. So what would you say to that? I guess I would say one is like that I think is the biggest thing in mental health right now is the connection piece. And because of COVID, we feel so much more connected on our phones to people. Right. And so I would say one is like, if you don't want to sit with your emotions, there's something underneath there that you need to work through that's like brewing. And you're like, I don't want to take this off. I don't want to deal with that. Right. So I would say just acknowledging that piece of it is the biggest heart. But biggest yeah. part is actually saying like, Ugh, I don't feel OK, not on my phone and disconnected. I think you're right. I think we've all been there where we're like, why are we avoiding just being alone with our thoughts? Like I used to play a podcast at all times while yes. I was washing my face, while I was showering, like no matter what I was doing. And I had to take a step back and be like, why am I incapable of just being just here with my yeah. thoughts? And then I like went to my journal and figured out it's because like there was something I just didn't want to think about. And journaling feels a lot less scary to me mm -hmm. personally than just like sitting there 
trying not to think about the thing, but knowing what you're not thinking about the whole thing. Like sometimes journaling is just like, okay, got it out on the page and now I can move on. Yeah. I was just going to recommend that too. It's like journaling can be, when you're overthinking, journaling is a great place to start because no one else has to know about it. And at least you can put it on paper and it's like energetically outside of yourself. Right. Yeah. That I was wondering what that was. That was so much less intimidating. But yeah, it's like you don't have to tell anyone. Mm-hmm. You don't have to confide in anyone. You, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole thing. It's just like let's leave it here in this book, yep. and it feels so much better after. And usually, I'll I'll come up with some sort of solution or like new perspective just through writing it out. Yep. Yeah. That's like morning pages, right? It's like yeah. doing kind of a brain dump right when you wake up so that you can help your body just go, okay, here are all these emotions and thoughts that I'm having and I'm going to dump them out on paper so they don't, you know, subconsciously just play like a record player all the time. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Let's get into ending segment, fun facts and favorites. What yes. is your top self-care tip? Ooh. I would have to say, I would have to say feeling your emotions somehow and just acknowledging them. That's, that is my top self-care tip because if you can feel your emotions, you can literally change your life. Oh, I love that. Okay. What's your morning routine? Oh, it's extensive. Um, I'll wake <laughs> up, but I try to keep it short. Okay. I'll give you like my abbreviated version because this yeah. is what I've been doing to try to like not overwhelm myself. Um, I always wake up and like go for a walk movement is like key to me because I will fall back asleep if I do not get out of my bed. Like (laughs) I was going and getting out of my bed and like meditating. I'm like, this is not, this is not giving me energy. So I'll walk for like 10 minutes, just like listening to the birds chirping, listening to the sounds outside. Um, And then I'll come back, drink my matcha and then meditate, read, and then I'll like get my day going. What meditation do you do? Melissa Wood Health, of course, or love I do um, Erica, which is great. On Wait, I love her, Erica um, Pusnelli. Yes. Oh my God, that's what I do every morning. Really, I love her. Yeah. We did like a we did a a one on one session, and I will like turn that on, and it's like around like thirty five minutes, but I will do that. I love her. Oh, that's really smart to record yeah. the one-on-one and then just keep reusing it. Yeah, I love her. I love that. Yeah, she's been on this podcast twice. I'm close with her. I like hosted an event with her. I'm obsessed with her. Oh my gosh, <laughs> amazing. Um, okay, what's your favorite way to move? Uh, horseback riding. Oh, I love that answer. That's new. Yeah. That's so nice. Okay, uh, wellness product you can't live without right now. Oh, there's this, it's called like raw maceuticals oil and it's this oil that I've been using on my face for like Ooh. four years and I, it's like I use like my gua sha and everything with it so I love it that's what I feel like I can't live without okay I'm new to gua sha I'm addicted I'm obsessed so good I'm obsessed and I just ran out of my oil the other night and I was literally searching last night like what face oil to get next if I should get the same one so I'm gonna I'll look into that one yeah Have I'll send, send you the it? link yeah it's okay so I've been using the drunk elephant, like luxury face oil oh. at night. Um, it's really nice. My my skin's really good with an oil. So Same. I feel like I can play around with the I feel like a lot of them are similar. Yeah. So I'll definitely try that one out. It's so good. It's pricey, but it's like so delicious. They all are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Are you a podcast listener? Yes. Okay. Podcast recommendation. What's your favorite podcast right now? Oh, that's good. I'm always a Skinny Confidential listener. Like I listen to them through and through every single time that they record. Um, I would say them and then The Pursuit of Wellness is also a great podcast. And also Soul on Fire by The Balanced Blonde. Like she's awesome as well. I listened to Jordan when I first got diagnosed with Lyme. So she's been like so helpful to like be on this journey and listen to her has been great. Love that. Yeah. Um, So you're a Dear Media person because I work there. So I work yes. for the financial. <laughs> so I love all the same podcasts. Um, okay. Where can the people find you? One-on-one coaching, all the things. Yeah. Everything is AllieKates.co. So TikTok, Instagram, website, you can find me at AllieKates.co. Amazing. And you said we could do a promo code for your online yes. course. What, 
what we could do we like twenty percent healing is hot twenty. We can do that. Or do you want to do a or dare to self care? Um, can we do? Can we do Jen Lauren just because all of them are yeah. that? Okay, okay Jen Lauren. Easy. Let's do Jen Lauren. Let's do twenty percent off my online course. So Jen Lauren twenty. Okay. Thank you so much, Allie. Thank and you. Of, of course. Um, we'll talk soon. Okay. Sounds good.